All right, we're going through Acts 23 this morning. Um, now, we're getting now to the chapters of Acts where I think people are less familiar with these stories because, you know, you read through Acts, one of the more interesting stories at the beginning. At the end, you're seeing a lot of the, the politics play out of the day and how they're dealing with Paul, the relationship even between the Romans and the Jews at the time. Um, but the spiritual lesson out of this is we see Paul's missionary journeys when he returns to Jerusalem, they're, they're, they're coming to an end. So his missionary journeys are coming to an end at Jerusalem. And now we're seeing how the Lord is protecting him and using him as he now goes to stand trial at Rome. So let's go through this chapter and uh, see some of the things that are going on here. So we'll divide this chapter into three parts. So the first part, we're going to see how Paul is dealt with by this Jewish council. Some people call it the Sanhedrin, this Jewish council that he has brought before. So prior, if you've forgotten what's happened, you know, he went back to Jerusalem. A lot of Jews didn't like him there. They were beating him. He spoke to, you know, on the steps in Hebrew to them. They, they didn't want to hear it anymore. They want to kill him. So Claudius Lysias, who's the chief captain, is bringing him to castle and says he's going to, you know, because he saved him from this crowd, now he's going to bring him before the Jewish leaders, the council, to say, well, let's actually judge what this person is about. Remember, Claudius Lysias didn't actually know who he was. He thought he was some Egyptian. Um, he's trying to get to the bottom of what, why, you know, they're such in an uproar over what Paul is saying, and he doesn't really understand all the... Uh, doctrinal issues that are going on here between what Paul was preaching and what the Jews were rejecting in Jesus Christ. Acts 23. So now Paul is before not just the, the mob anymore. Now he's before the Jewish leaders. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God this day. Now, I think it's very important for us as Christians that we live a life in good conscience. So you don't always know what is the right or wrong thing to do, but you know, your conscience, your conscience is not just this feeling that you get. Some people think that you know, your conscience is like this sixth sense and they just think, oh, I just know whether it's right or wrong. That's not what the conscience is, in my opinion. You know, that is just people just appealing to their emotion and just calling it their conscience when they just say, well, I just get this sixth sense or this feeling, it just feels right to me, this gut instinct. That's not what the conscience is. The conscience, as I believe, and I've taught on this before, your conscience is just the knowledge that you have. Now, that could be knowledge that you get from God's word, from the Bible. It could be knowledge that you have learned from others, from the council. It could be inherent knowledge that God has just put into the hearts of men. Or it could be knowledge that you've gained from, from just experience, just in life. And that sum total of knowledge is your conscience. So then you're not, that's why your conscience comes into play when you're judging what's right to do, because you have God's word, which is the foundation of a decision that you'll make. But then you're going to apply to that what you know, your experience, your wisdom, wisdom from others to decide what is the right thing to do. And your conscience, your sum knowledge of your conscience will judge in yourself, I think that's right, or I think that's wrong. And what the Bible teaches is that when you have all that knowledge and you judge this is the right thing to do, this is the wrong thing to do, you should not go against your conscience. Now, obviously, it's going to always line up with God's Word. So you have to, God's Word is one of the factors that is going to align into the decision of what your conscience decides. But there are things in life that are not just determined by the Bible. They're going to be determined by your conscience. And you should not go against your conscience. So we saw in Acts where there are times when I believe Paul made the wrong decision. But then he could still stand here before the Jewish Sanhedrin, before the Jewish council, and say, I lived in good conscience. Because he believed he was doing the right thing. He was not going against his conscience. He wasn't thinking, no, that's not the best thing to do. That's not the right thing to do. But I, I'm going to do it anyway for expedience sake. He believed it was the right thing to do in that moment. And this is a clear teaching in the Bible that we should not go against 
our conscience. James 4.17, look at what it says here. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So it's not always what is right or wrong. Sometimes it's what's better to do. You know, something better to do, you don't do it. To him it is sin. And then in Romans 14.23, it's the opposite. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So James 4 is saying, hey, if there's something good and you don't do it, it's sin. Romans 14 is saying, hey, if you don't think this is the right thing to do, and yet you do it anyway, then that, then that is sin. So you've got both sides there. But as believers, you know, we should live a life with a clear conscience. That's what that means. With a clear conscience, it means you believe you are doing what's right with all the knowledge that you have. It's the right decision to make. So just be careful that you don't uh, treat the conscience or believe the conscience is just your emotions. I don't think it's that. I don't think your conscience is your emotions. I think it is making a wise decision with the knowledge that you have. And this is why. But what, what, is, what is the word conscience when you break it down? Con is with and science is knowledge. So it's, you do the things with the knowledge that you possess. But it's not just knowledge from the Bible. Like I said, it's knowledge from experiences and wisdom and counsel and all that. It's not just a feeling, okay? So that's why when you see in the Bible, it says they were convicted by their own conscience. It's because they knew what they were doing was wrong, even though they were trying to say what they were doing was right. All right, let's continue. Acts 23, 2. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So Paul is not even finished talking here. He just says, hey, I've lived in good conscience this day. And then the high priest says to the person next to him, like, basically, you, um, you know, shut him up. So he punches him or hits him across or slaps him across the face. Smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, so look at how Paul responds to this assault that was commanded by the high priest Ananias. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. So here we see in verse 2 and 3, what I believe is Paul's righteous anger. So sometimes people respond in anger, but sometimes it is justified to respond in anger and to sort of bite back. It's not, all, it's not always right to do, but it's not always wrong to do either. So a lot of people believe being angry or standing up for yourself or speaking back is always wrong. No, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's even a verse, I don't have it in my notes, but when Jesus looked on people with anger. I mean, obviously God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says in the Old Testament. So it can't be a sin to be angry. The question is, can you be angry at something and have a righteous anger and not sin? So now I think here, obviously, Paul has responded in anger and he has said some sharp words back to the high priest. Reading different comments online, some people think here Paul you know, was in the wrong doing this. I don't think he was in the wrong doing this. And then the next couple of verses, some people believe, well, he sort of responded in anger and then kind of, you know, regretted it when how he responds later. I don't think so. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think Paul is responding in anger. He's rebuking the high priest, and rightly so, because the high priest is being a hypocrite by wanting to be in this council, wanting to judge according to certain laws, and then he's just assaulting Paul uh, contrary to um, the laws and not, not even hearing what Paul has to say before telling him to be assaulted. Now look here in verse 4. It says, And as they stood by, and they that stood by said, Revile us, thou God's high priest. Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So this is why some people think here that he responded in anger, sort of regretted it, and then said, well, I didn't know who I was talking to. It was the high priest. You know, I shouldn't speak evil of the ruler of my people. But do you think Paul, being raised a Pharisee, raised at the feet of Gamaliel, didn't know who Ananias was? Of course, of course he knew who Ananias was. So 
what I think is happening here is he's rebuking Ananias for what he did. And then the statement that he's saying here, I think, is in sarcasm, where the person is saying to him that stood by, hey, are you reviling God's high priest? And when he says, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, he's being sarcastic here because he knows there is no longer a physical high priest, that the true high priest is Jesus Christ, and he's not speaking against Jesus Christ. He's saying, you know, I, I didn't know that I was speaking to the high priest. So this is what I think is going on here, that he's actually being sarcastic, saying, well, if I knew he was the high priest, I wouldn't be speaking evil against him. But he's not the high priest, because Jesus is the high priest. That's why he's keeping the commandment, not to speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So this is a teaching in Hebrews, and Paul knows well, that there is no longer a high priest, right? Because the priesthood is done away. The, the high priest now is Jesus Christ. Seeing then, Hebrews 4, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we, can, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the priesthood was a shadow of the true priesthood. The Levitical priesthood, when Jesus died and rose again, was done away, as we read in Hebrews. The true priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek, continues, and the high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's continue in verse 6, Acts 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So what Paul did here is quite wise, is he recognised that there were two factions within the council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what he actually does here by making his defence, first of all and primarily solely about the resurrection, is he divides the council on an issue that he knows they disagree on. So if you know in the Gospels, you have the Pharisees and you have the Sadducees. And these two factions did not agree on the resurrection. The Sadducees actually rejected the resurrection. So we'll see here in Matthew 22, I'll show you here. Matthew 22, 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, and unto the seventh. So it's like when you go soul winning, and you're trying to make a point, and you know, sometimes the analogies get crazier and crazier and crazier as you uh, are trying to prove your point. This is what's happening here with the Sadducees. The Sadducees come to Jesus and say, hey, well, if you believe in the resurrection, what if you have, you know, a man that marries a woman, you know, and then he dies, and then you have another man, and then he marries her, and then he dies, and then up to seven brothers, you know, they all marry her, they all die. Well, who's going to be her husband in heaven? You know, so they try to show, in their mind, the ridiculousness, in their mind, of the resurrection. Obviously, Jesus responds to them. So this, is, this, this scenario is not only in the Gospel of Matthew, it's in another Gospel as well, in different words. So they say here in verse 28, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So they think that they've got Jesus. You know, hey, there's this scenario of your belief. It doesn't fit. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
So he's saying to them, hey, you don't even understand the resurrection and marriage. And marriage is till death do us part. So when they resurrect it, they're not married still. It's not this one woman in heaven who has seven husbands because each of them married her. And when they resurrect, they're all still husband and wife. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So, there's this faction, the Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection. So when Paul is called into question between the two, he actually plays this quite wisely, doesn't he? He plays this situation quite wisely, where he understands there's these two factions, and they, he plays themselves against each other. Now, this whole scenario in Acts, where Paul is preaching the gospel, He's being quite wise, and he's brought before councils, before governors, before kings, is exactly what Jesus said would happen to his disciples in Matthew 10. And even where I get this passage from, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Look at Matthew 10. You read this passage. This is exactly what Paul is going through. That's why when you see Paul go through these last few chapters, we see the beginning of the church in Acts, and then we see the, the great works of the apostles, the great works of Paul. But then these last few chapters is also seeing how Jesus is sort of fulfilling this promise in Matthew 10 through the life of Paul, specifically with Paul. Matthew 10, 16, look at this. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. What is he being brought before in Acts 23? The Jewish council. And they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. This is what we're going to see at the end of this chapter, the next chapter. For a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought, how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So this is what we see happening in Acts 23. You know, Paul does something very kind of sly here, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, where he causes the dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 9, and there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove. See, so now they're arguing with them, saying, we find no evil spirit in this man. But if a spirit or an angel had spoken him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain fearing, lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, right? So, you know, you can imagine the, 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 the imagery here is that you know, Paul is torn between these two factions, saying, hey, let him go. And the other saying, no, no, we need to condemn him. And to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Now, you see these words here from the Pharisees where they say, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against God. This is very similar to what Gamaliel said in Acts chapter 5. So we see in Acts chapter 5 when the disciples were kicking up a big commotion. And I'm sure Paul knew this counsel from Gamaliel when he said this to the Jews. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. So this is before Saul has now, you know, he, he's joined them, but he obviously knew this is how Gamaliel wanted to deal with the apostles early on. And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rode up Theudas, boasting himself to be somebody who, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. And this man Judas, so I'll skip over this for the sake of time, but he gives basically like these two figures that said, hey, if this is of God, they rose up and, and they would remain. Now, the counsel that he gave to the Jews is not true. This was just his advice because there are many 
false religions and false prophets that were not of God and yet have lasted to today. I mean, think about the Mormon church. Think about Islam, where these people, you know, were raised themselves up and have, la have lasted till now, and yet these movements were not of God. But what Gamaliel was saying, hey, if it's not of God, it will come to naught. So he's saying, hey, just leave them alone. Unless, he says here, but this is what I want to show you in verse 39, which is very similar to what we read in Acts 23. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Now what's interesting is that maybe Paul knew this is how the Pharisees would respond if he brought up a topic that he knew that they disagreed with the Sadducees on. So he brings up this topic that they know the Pharisees and the Sadducees disagree with the resurrection. He's saying, hey, I'm being called into question because of the resurrection. So how do the Pharisees respond? According to Gamaliel's counsel, hey, why don't we just leave them alone? Because if it's, if it's of God, you won't be able to fight against it. And if it's not of God, it's going to come to naught. Which is, like I said, it's not true counsel, but that was Gamaliel's response. Now, why would Paul have known this? Well, because Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. Like we read in the, the last chapter, Acts 22, 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So I think Paul, in Acts 23, knew the psyche of these warring factions within the Jews and used it to his advantage. So, you know, this is wisdom here, being wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. So this goes to show that, you know, Christians, as we navigate this evil world, we should not navigate it without a pure conscience, like Paul, like we talked about. We should not also navigate this world in ignorance either. You know, not understand how people think, why they think the way they do. Different, you know, internal warring factions, whether politically or religiously. You know, like when you go preach the gospel, you know, let's say we, we're in an area with a lot of Muslims, like, are, are, you, are you aware of that? Are you aware that there are different Muslims that believe different things and the different nuances? See, this is the sort of wisdom that you need to try and gain to be a more effective witness. We want to be a fisher of men like Jesus, a fisher of men like Paul. You can't be ignorant to these things. And people that, Christians that are ignorant to these things are not going to be as good of a fisher of men as somebody that is not ignorant of these things. And you see Paul. See, Paul is using his wisdom, his experience, to deal with this situation wisely, as Jesus said in Mark 10, and we see here in Acts 23. So let's go on. Last verse here, verse 11. And the night following, so now Claudius Lysias, who's the chief captain in this, Aaron, takes and saves him from this crowd again, pulls him into the castle, and as he's captive in Roman uh, custody, Jesus appears to him. Night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So, I mean, this is some great assurance that not only Paul you know, has the promise of God that Jesus is with him always, but Jesus actually appears to him and says, This is according to God's will, and you will go to Rome. So, Imagine the confidence that Paul has, you know, dealing with this situation. It's not that he's not going through tribulation. He's not, you know, risk of death. He's being beaten. He's being pulled two ways and there's a lot of commotion going on. But even in that storm, he has peace because Jesus is with him. It's like that picture of the disciples on the ship going through that storm, but having peace at the same time. See, we can go through the storms of life and have peace at the same time, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. You know, when I see those words, be of good cheer, immediately my mind goes to John 16. John 16, 33. Jesus said here, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. 
In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So as Jesus appears to Paul, you know, in that room, wherever he is, you can imagine the peace that would come over Paul knowing that Jesus Christ is with him. So let's go on. Now you can see Paul put that peace into practice. The conspiracy to kill Paul. Acts 23, 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. So these more than 40 people say, we are not going to eat or drink anything until Paul is killed. So you can see the timeline in which they plan to do it because they want to do this quickly. That's why they, they bound themselves under this, this curse. And then they let the Jewish council let them know about this plan. So you can see the corruptness of this Jewish council, that they know about a plot to murder somebody and yet they're going to play along with it, right? So that's why this, this Jewish council is corrupt to the core. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that ye bring him down. So they, they want the, the council to be accomplice to this murder. Bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, wherever he come near, are ready to kill him. So what do they say? They go to the council and say, pretend, go to the governor and say, hey, we want to examine Paul a bit more diligently. And when they send Paul to come and be examined, that's when we're going to ambush him. That's when we're going to kill him. Now, this situation, it reminds me a bit of the over-the-top over reactions of protesters in the world today. You know, you see on social media some of the overtop protests that go on, you know, they're either blocking traffic, you know, like sitting in front of trucks and cars, or they're, you know, the tree huggers, they're known for chaining themselves to trees while, the, you know, the, the choppers are coming. But recently you have, I don't know if you've seen these things on social media where, you know, the the vegans and the animal rights activists, they go into the shopping center and they're just like pouring the milk all on the ground as, as though that's saving animals, right? So they're doing that. And then the, 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 the other one I saw recently, I don't know if it was too recent, but these, uh, these protesters went into an art gallery and then like super glued their hands to the wall or something like that. But when I see this, where people are just doing this over the top, like why would you even do this to yourself? If you want to kill somebody, just kill them. Why would you do that? you know, say, well, we're not even going to eat or drink anything, you know. So the question remains is because we know Paul did not get killed and he went to Rome. So what became of these people? Did they just starve to death? I don't think so. So maybe they weren't as serious about their vow as, as they make it out to be. But this is over the top reaction to their evil intent. And it's almost like evil people lose their sense of rationality that they're wanting to do this. Acts 23, 16. So, Paul's sister's son. So, it's interesting here that you don't really think about in the New Testament or in the early church, people's families. You know, you think of, you think of uh, Peter. You think of, okay... He's this fisherman. They kind of just leave their, they, they leave their fishing and then they go and serve Jesus. But no, Peter was married. Remember, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus came. So you see amongst this community people that know them, their family. I mean, Paul had a sister here. So this man here that hears of this plot to kill Paul is his nephew. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Now, why, why is this important? Because family pressure is a very strong force that people are scared of. They, they are fearful of when they want to do things for God. It's a lot easier to do things 
in front of people that you don't know than in front of people you do know. That's just a fact. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no different, right? But we, we ought not let that make us fearful of doing things for God. You know, some people, they're, they're worried about what their family thinks. They're worried about what people they know think. You know, sometimes you're going to go evangelism or you're going to do something. You're going to go soul winning. You're worried. Or well, what if I run into somebody I know? Should that be our mindset? We should be bold like Paul, like Peter, knowing that, yes, why don't we be that light? I mean, you know, when you shine light in a dark place, do not sometimes people recoil at it? That's what it's going to be like at the beginning. But then as light fills that place, they get used to that. So just keep that in mind. That, yeah, at the beginning, yeah, it's going to be a bit different. But, you know, you're being that light. You're being that ambassador. And just like as Paul, Paul, you know, there's a big change in his life. I mean, imagine the pressures that he was under. He was not only well known in that place, but he was quite high up as well in the religious order. And here he is serving God, facing all the people that he would have known in his community. So Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait. He told and entered into the castle and told Paul. So now Paul hears of this conspiracy. Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he had a certain thing to tell him. So he took him. So this is the centurion looking after Paul in the prison. He took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say unto thee. <clears throat> then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is that thou hast to tell me? And what basically happens here is he tells the chief captain the conspiracy that he heard about. He said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they're ready looking for a promise from them. So the chief captain then let the young, men, young man depart and charged him, see thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Now, this situation of Paul in the prison reminds me a lot of Joseph in the Old Testament. Because... First of all, Paul's sister's son is able to access Paul quite easily. And then Paul says to the centurion looking after him, hey, can you bring this man to go talk to the chief captain? Now try that in New South Wales. Like if, you're in, if you're in prison and you just ask one, hey, can you bring this to go talk to the chief captain? And uh, They're going to say, sit down and shut up and stay in the, the cell. So it goes to show that Paul has gained, has carried some favour with the centurions and the Romans even in his time in captivity. So it reminds me a lot of Joseph. When Joseph was in prison, God was able to give him favour in the eyes of the people who were keeping him in the prison. Joseph, uh, Genesis 39, Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. Remember even Paul when he's taken to, uh, um, to, to Felix, he's also put in Herod's judgment hall. So it's the same here. The king's prisoners were bound. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So that scenario with Joseph reminds me a lot about when Paul is in prison, that even though he's in prison, God is with him, taking care of him, keeping him, protecting him, even giving him favour in the eyes of the people that are taking care care of him, where to the point where he can ask even things of the centurion, and they do it. And he called unto him, let's continue, verse 23, and he called unto him two centurions, saying, make ready. So what has happened here? Now the chief captain knows about this conspiracy 
of the 40 people trying to kill Paul. And look at his response in protecting Paul. And you've got to ask yourself the question, is this the centurion's doing? Is this the chief captain's doing? Or is this God's doing? Is this God protecting Paul? Because look at how many soldiers he gives Paul. You think he's a bit over the top for 40 people. He called unto him two centurions. So what is a centurion? Somebody that is in charge of 100 soldiers. Two said, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen three score and ten. So that's 70 horsemen. And spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. So how many is that in total? 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. This is 470 people defending one man from 40 Jews. So God is protecting Paul here because God wants Paul to go to Rome, right? Like he said in verse 11, he says, be of good cheer. Like you've testified of me here, you will testify of me in Rome. And then God here is making sure, that Jesus Christ is making sure that he's making it to Rome. Provide the beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix, the governor. So there's two images here that I think are interesting. So you see now the Jewish community that knew Paul, that knew what he was getting persecuted for, is now surrounded by 470, 400 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and he is being marched off to Rome. So two thoughts here. One is, there's a bit of sadness. Sadness because this departure of Paul in some way symbolises the departure of truth from Jerusalem. Because he was there to preach the gospel to Jerusalem, the Jews rejected the truth, and now this man who kind of represents God's truth at Jerusalem is being marched off out of Jerusalem. He's being driven out of Jerusalem. But at the same time, there is a symbol, symbolism of joy because Paul, as this soldier of Christ, being surrounded by soldiers, is now being marched off to preach the gospel at Rome. So I think that, that image there is, is very interesting. That I don't know if you realised how many people were actually surrounding Paul. Now let's uh, just finish the last bit quickly. I don't have too much to say on this last section. Now Paul is sent to Felix. Acts 23, 25. And he wrote a letter after this manner. <clears throat> so this is Claudius Lysias, the chief captain. He's writing a letter unto Felix, who's the governor. And in the next few chapters, we can see Paul dealing with Felix, Festus, and all, and all these others. Claudius Lysias, under the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. Now, what I want you to think about as we read this letter is how Claudius Lysias is explaining the situation to Felix versus what actually happened from what we know in Acts. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now think about what happened in Acts. Is that what happened? Remember when the Jews wanted to kill him? He thought this guy was some Egyptian that was like causing an uproar in the city. But no, you see the politics. See, this is where you see the politics here. Of when he sends him to um, Felix, it's not that he's worried about the offending the Jews, which is really what's happening here. He's trying to please the Jews. Remember, he was going to scourge, you know, he's going to examine him by scourging, you know, all these things. He was trying to, he was trying to please the Jews. But then when he realized he was a Roman citizen, now his hands are tied. But he's sending him off to Felix to say, well, I saved him from this crowd because I'm standing up for the rights of our citizens. You know, he's a Roman citizen. That's why. But it, that's, that's not really the truth, is it? That's why you can see this, 
these politics going on here between the different societies. And it's a bit like today. Rome representing this Western democracy, it kind of reminds me of today's scenario. Rome is this sort of Western, say, democracy, bastion of democracy, worried about offending the Jews. And what do we see today? We see all the Western democracy, all the dem democratic societies today. They're all worried about offending the Jews. Nobody wants to speak against Israel. Even though, you know, we talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict, bad things are done on both sides, yet everyone's happy to condemn Hamas, but nobody's happy to condemn some of the, the things that the is Israelites have done or the Israel armies have done in the past, which have been going on for decades. Why? Same political pressures. You see the political pressure back here of the Jewish leaders, same things happening today. So it's all the, politic, the politics that you can see. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but have, laid, but have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. So, be, so Claudius Lysias even admits in his letter that Paul is innocent, that he hasn't done anything wrong or worthy of death. The only reason why is that, hey, we're just facilitating this thing between him and the Jews. But what is the real thing that's going on here? I think it's the politics of the day that Claudius Lysias is scared about the Jews. He doesn't want to deal with it himself, so now he's handballing it. He's escalating it up to somebody else, to Felix, and he's making it about, well, we're trying to defend this Roman citizen, which was not initially what it was about. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before, to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. So he admits that Paul is innocent. He escalates to Felix rather than facing the wrath of the Jews himself. Acts 23, 31. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. So this is just another city. So remember, Paul was being marched off by 470 soldiers, 70 on horseback. But then it says they only took him up to Antipatris, which was quite a fair way away. And then on the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. So from Antipatris to where Felix is in Caesarea, only the horsemen accompanied him and the soldiers on foot returned back to Jerusalem who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So he says, okay, he's under my jurisdiction, I'll hear this case, and next chapter we'll see them now come to Caesarea where there's actually a court hearing heard between the Jews and Paul. So <clears throat> what is very interesting about this situation is this persecution is creating the situation where Paul will preach the gospel in a Roman court of law. So imagine like that happening today where there's a public court case that everyone's interested in. And what is this court case about? This is about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and whether he's resurrected, whether he is the Messiah. So what is interesting here is God is actually creating this scenario where this thing will be heard and made, made public and maybe even on the public record where the Romans are actually officiating this court hearing between the Jewish Sanhedrin and Paul the Apostle. Isn't that amazing? So, and he will have the ability to preach, preach freely. It's like in a court case where you can state your case, make your arguments, they're heard, they're documented, they're all heard publicly. This is the situation that is being created with Paul. So it's not only for the public interest, but it's also in Paul's life, an opportunity to actually preach the gospel to these governors and to these nobles as well, as we see in the last few chapters. And when I think about this scenario, that's why you can always go back to these teachings of Jesus, things that Paul reflects on in his letters. But I believe Paul actually reflects on this in his Philippian letter, 
where he knows he's undergoing this persecution, but he knows that it's going to be used for God's glory. Philippians 1.12, he says to the Philippians, but I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my sins in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So through Paul's trials, the gospel is preached, Jesus Christ is glorified, and other people are emboldened to preach the gospel as well. So this should encourage us, as sometimes we will go through trials and tribulations, we will undergo persecution for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we know, like with Paul, Jesus Christ was with him. And that's I, where I want to end this sermon. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. This is the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. See, that last part of the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is sometimes the part we forget about because we aren't as bold as we ought to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sometimes filled with fear as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ and preach the gospel. But we shouldn't because the same Lord Jesus, which was with Paul in the prisons in Jerusalem and to Rome, is the same Jesus Christ that is with you today. So we can rest on that promise, on that assurance, the same assurance that he gave to his disciples in John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being with us always as you promised us in your word. Lord, give us boldness as you gave boldness to Paul. Give us wisdom as you gave wisdom to Paul to preach the gospel and to win many souls for you. Lord, use us, use this church, and we pray and ask in your precious name. Amen.